We are in a series that I've titled Fight For It. And if you weren't here last week, I actually want to inspire you to go and listen to it on the website. Um, I believe it will, it will change how you think about the tough times in life. You see, we all fight for something each and every single day of our lives. Um, people, people tend to say, no, I, you know what, I prefer peace. I don't like fighting. Well, just to have peace in this life, you need to fight for it. Um, some people fight for their children. Other people fight for an income. Some people fight just to make a living each and every single day of their life. So we all are consistently confronted with there's a battle that I need to fight in my life. And the one thing that, I've, that, I, that we talk about in this series is why don't you fight for resilience? Fight for resilience. And the meaning of resilience means bouncing back from disruption. We all get disruption in our lives. Through sickness, maybe you're going through a bad patch in your marriage, maybe your finances just goes down the drain. Uh, whatever the case might be, at work, your professional life, we all face challenges each and every single day of our lives, and it's got an effect on our lives. And fighting for resilience means fighting so that that effect is not as, as severe as it can be. And fighting for resilience means me getting through this bump in the road is a bit shorter I just go through it quicker. I learn to recover quicker. So that's resilience. And normally this sounds great to fight for resilience, but most people run away from things like disruption. We just want to go over it and not through it and just skip it maybe. And we try to get away from it, and many times we don't understand it. So last week we, we spoke about this, and James actually gave us his insight on disruption and how we can find joy even though it happens in the middle of my, my trial, I can even find joy. I'm not glad because I have a trial, but I can find joy in it. And he told us how to actually be resilient when we face stuff like this. So you're welcome to go and listen to that. And even Jesus said, I've told you these things so that it may, so that it, that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. We can face anything with resilience because Jesus showed us how to. If we keep our eyes on him, we can go through anything. So today I want to make a statement. When I start and continue with the series, I want to make the statement, your weakness is the key to resilience. And this is not something we like to hear because people don't like to speak about their insecurities and their weaknesses. They don't actually like to tell you that I need help. It's something that, that we actually also run away from. I'd rather focus on my strengths. Because my strengths is the thing that take me through every day, that help me to accomplish everything that I want to accomplish. And that's why when we meet new people, the one thing we always tell me new people is this, this, the good stuff about us. The strengths we have, the education we have, the job we're doing, because that makes us important. That makes us self-confident. That makes us want to present myself to the world. And anything that you do that you accomplish, it's actually, is it God or is it you? You're honest, but you know, God gave me the ability. But so many times we start relying on ourselves. We actually go there by default. And we don't focus on our weaknesses. And Paul actually teaches us the key to resilience is our weakness, not your strength. That's not the key to resilience. Paul He's a guy that, um, and I'm going to show you this practically this morning. Paul is a guy that uh, decided later, after Jesus has died and resurrected from a grave and ascended into heaven, he decided to follow Jesus after Jesus showed himself to Paul and said, I want you to work for me. And Paul was a very high educated guy. He had an oppressive CV and he was actually persecuting Christians when Jesus said, no, 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 this is the wrong job. I want you to do exactly the opposite. Come and work for me. And he started working for Jesus, and he was a very influential guy. And he planted most of the churches in the New Testament. And he wrote 15 of the books in the, in the New Testament in the Bible. He was, he, was, he was very gifted as a man. And never once you would ever read, except for this passage that I'm going to read you this morning, that he ever came to a place and bragged about who he was and what his, what his position in life was and how God positioned him and all the achievement that he's got. He never bragged about his CV, ever. In actual fact, he introduced him to everyone as a slave 
He said, I was a slave of Christ. And the only way to know a slave is by his master's name, not even by his name. That was how Paul wanted to be known by the world. Because he had this desire to lift up Christ and not himself. It was never about him. So he, he never actually bragged. He actually think it was futile. And what happened is he planted one of the biggest churches. The one was in Antioch. The other one was in Corinth. Corinth, And he planted this church and he started this church. And this was a, this was a major cultural city. Everybody would want to go there and see the place and experience culture and experience sports. And they were always amazed by the architecture and the qualifications of the people and the wisdom. There was also, there was just this status about Corinth. And the people were always impressed by it. And Paul never introduced himself as a guy with his qualifications. And he planted the church. And after Paul, there came a bunch of false prophets. Guys who were Jews or just people who had high status and who were studied, they had, they had good qualifications. And they came there and they, they introduced themselves by, by giving everyone their CV of how great we are. And this is why you need to listen to us. And they just listened to them. And Paul was a bit disturbed with this. And in 1 Corinthians, the first letter he wrote to the church, he didn't know about this, so that letter is great. I mean, that's 1 Corinthians 13, all about love. And, and 2 Corinthians, you can, you, can, you can see that Paul is not that happy anymore. So he's, he's giving them a warning. He says, guys, you don't understand what this is all about. And he tells them in this letter that it's by your weakness that you find strength, not by your strength. Now, if a weak person takes a mic like I this, like me this morning, and I tell you guys, uh, guys, I'm weak, and I just want to tell you it's by your weakness that you find strength, you're going to think twice before you listen to me because I've, I've been looking for a justification because I'm weak. So Paul couldn't just tell them that. He needed to tell them, hey, guys, I'm actually a guy with a CV. And then he told them, but it's not by that that I can be qualified to tell you this. It's by my weakness. And so he, he had to brag about who he was. Ah. So he started and he, he said this. In the, in the verse just before this one, he says, I sound like a dumb person. He said, are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendant? So am I. He says, I sound dumb to actually tell this to you. Are they servants of Christ? I am out of my mind to talk like this. I am more than they are. I have a more impressive CV than they have. I've worked much harder. You can go and read this. You can, if you read the whole Second Corinthians, you even this is in Corinthians eleven. You'll find it already in the first chapter. He's going on this thing that guys, I'm weak. Even though I can give a more impressive CV than these guys, I'm actually weak. I only I don't, I don't like to talk about my strengths, and I, and it's stupid to talk about. And we live in a culture where everything is based on the strongest guy get the job, the guy with the best qualification will get the job, and it's obvious today for business, it's good for business. But even in our, in our own social circles and everything, everything is about who's who and from where. What is your lineage? And what is your qualification? And how can I spend my time with you? If you're not a person of influence, I'm wasting my time. Many times that's the way we view life. And I don't want to waste my life. And Paul says, I'm actually foolish to need to start with my CV. And then he says in verse 12, verse 1, he says, I must go on boasting. I must do this so that you guys will actually believe what I'm going to say next. Although there's nothing to be gained, it's actually stupid of me to actually give you my CV. I will go on to visitations and revelations from the Lord. The other guys gave a CV, but they did not talk about visitations and revelations of the Lord. He even had a, a, another department on his cv so he's actually saying listen those guys has got a three-page cv i've got three books if you want to compare apples with apples and then he talks about himself in a third person he says and he does this for a reason because he doesn't want people to think that he's the guy he's this 
strong man. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up into the third heaven. Whether it was in his body or out the body, I do not know. God knows. He's talking about himself. He's telling them that 14 years ago I was in heaven. Guys, I just want to say this. If I will be in heaven tomorrow, whether in my body or in spirit, you will hear about it next Sunday. And I'll most probably write the book, and I'll most probably tell you why God chose me to go. That's how we do it today. He says, but like you said, I'm out of my mind telling you guys this. 14 years, he never said anything in 14 years about this. If this happens today to me or to us, no, I'm not going to keep quiet. Nobody even know. And I know that this man, whether in the body or in part from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up in the paradise and heard impress inexpressible things, things that no one is actually permitted to tell. Because it's between you and God. We use stuff like this to actually um, justify that I'm a child of God. We actually use this, I actually want to call it spiritual pridefulness. In actual fact, it's not from God. Just to show, no, I'm proclaiming the good news, but I'm so special. No way that was Paul's intent. He only had one intent, and that was to lift up Christ and not himself. And listen to what he says in the next sentence. I will boast a man like a man. I will boast about a man like that, a man that is a servant to Christ. But I will not boast about myself. I will not boast about myself. I will not brag ever about myself. That's not who I am. So he doesn't give us specific details about heaven. So he tells us about it just to tell us that I'm not going to brag about it. Just to show everybody that I'm also an impressive guy with an impressive CV. Except about my weaknesses. If there's something I will boast about, it will be my weaknesses. And then he gives us an example. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. In other words, he says, Paul says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, which means in his body he had a weakness. And there's many different Uh, theologians with many different views on what this really was. If you read through all these letters, they say they think he was epileptic. And in that time, if you were epileptic, it meant you had a demon. You were demon-possessed. And everybody just spit on you when they passed by. And in one of his letters, he actually thanked the people for not spitting on him. Other people say, no, he was going blind, and that's why he wrote to such big letters so that everybody, so that he could actually see what he was writing. Other people say, no, it's because of all the, 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 the um, persecution that he went through that he was actually physically deformed, his face. Because, I mean, he was stoned once. Stoned means put you there, throw you with stones until you lie on the ground, then somebody with a big rock comes and throw it on your head and you're left for dead. He got up and he walked away. And he kept on doing what he was doing. He was hit with sticks five times, left for dead, and he got up. So, so they say that it, this could have been anything. And Paul says, I got this. And I prayed to God three times to take it away. Because I didn't like this weakness. It, was, it felt like it was holding me back. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. So God says to Paul, that your weakness is the key to experience my power. Not your strengths, not your qualifications, not the important person that you are, that you believe to be. If I can come to God and say, Lord, I know this is the stuff that I'm not good with. Um, I'm not good with relationships. I struggle to talk to people. Um, I've got a bad uh, case of um, uh, not humor. Um, 
I can't. I've got a bad case of anger issues. That's maybe what I'm looking for. If I can come to God and I tell Lord, Lord, this is stuff that I struggle with. And I find that's where I'm going to find God. And that's where God's going to show me. But I can be strong in this area of your life. I can be strong through you. I can help you with this. Because when I am out of control of my life, He can take control of my life. And many times I need to reach my end for God to take over. I made perfect in your weakness, he said to him. Therefore, I will boast all the more. In other words, Paul changed his mind. Sometimes people say, no, Paul got this thorn in the flesh and he prays to God to take it away and he's still sad about it. He's not still sad about it. After the third time, he realized why he got it. And he got happy because he had it. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness, so that Christ's power may rest on me. And I was now he's going around and says, guys, you know what? Uh, because of all the severe uh, torture that I went through, I can actually stand today and say God is good. I actually feel God's power inside of me, even though I've been through what I've been through. I actually see God working through me while I look like this, while I experience a, a epileptic scenario, I can be strong because of my weaknesses. He actually started to brag about it. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. When I am weak, then I am strong. Each and every time my life gets disrupted, each and every time when I feel weak, it's God that's showing up to be strong. And when God shows up, I'm happy and everybody else is happy. So the key to go through those things is not your strengths. It's not to make your strong side stronger. It's actually to admit that I've got weaknesses. Just, just imagine this in a marriage. Husband and wife having a fight. And the wife starting admitting her weaknesses. And the husband starting admitting his weaknesses. How long is that fight going to last? You can't be angry at someone for being weak. Especially if they admit it. Usually we go into a fight in a marriage because my pride is too strong. I feel I don't get what I deserve. That's why I'm getting angry. What's going to happen if we admit our weaknesses to one another? We might just see love prevail more stronger in my marriage than ever before. There's strength in my weakness. There's a story of the disciples that followed Jesus, and Jesus said to them, listen, you need to go and tell everybody about this, that they... They are weak, they are sinful, they deserve a, a excruciating wrath of a death. But they're not going to get it. Because I'm going to go to the cross. I'm going to get forgiveness for their sin. So I'm going to die so that they can be strong again. Disciples, you need to go with this good news to everybody and go and tell it to them. Now, Jesus' disciples... None of them had an impressive CV. In actual fact, they had no CV. They did not learn. They did not study. Nothing. Jesus actually went onto the beach where they were catching fish for a living. And he, he said, hey, listen, you, you're good enough to follow me. Let's go. In your weakness, I'm going to be made strong. And these guys decided, okay, let's run with this message of Jesus. Just after Jesus went to heaven, they got excruciating boldness, the Bible tells us. And they actually went into the temple. And when they got to the temple, there was a lame guy there who said, can you please give me money, Peter and John? And Peter just said, no, money I don't have, gold and silver I don't have, but what I have I'll give to you. And he took his hand and he pulled him up to his feet. And when he pulled him up to his feet, his legs got strong and he walked. And he was lame his life, through, all through his life. And all the people standing there were so amazed, they just rushed to see this and experience this. And Peter st stood up and he started preaching boldly. Uneducated, no CV. And during that time, there was a law given by the Jews that nobody should tell people about Jesus that's risen from the grave. And here Peter is talking about Jesus that was risen from the grave with all the boldness. 
and they arrested them, threw them into jail for a night. The next day, they challenged them in court. And he stood up again and he said, I will not keep my mouth shut. I will talk about this. And that guy that was healed was standing right next to Peter while he was talking. And this, they warned them, and this was the reaction of all those intelligent, impressive CV people. They said, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were, they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. They were astonished by the power of God that worked through them because of their weaknesses, not because of their abilities or their strengths. There's a book that was wrote by a, by a woman. Her name is Corrie Ten Boom. She wrote this book, Tramp for the Lord. And in this book, she tells the story when she went to Russia. And Russia had a Cold War, and they persecuted Christians. Um, they were quite cruel to the Christians in Russia. And they dragged them out of their houses and killed them on the street and put them in jail. It was a, it was a very bad time in Russia. And she, she was there working and she was she went into this um man and woman's house and when she went into the living room there was this woman sitting on a couch each and every single day she actually lived on the couch but she was so deformed in her body because of a sickness that she had she was almost unrecognizable um i don't know what they call it in english in afrikaans they call it vielfoudige sclerose um and the only thing that was working on her whole body was her right hand's index finger. And she could move this hand. And what she did each and every single day, she typed on a computer. But she didn't only type, she actually translated the Bible into Russia, to Russian, and Christian books into Russian with this finger. And, um, and Corey sat there and she thought to herself, Lord, but why don't you heal this lady? Why didn't you heal this lady? And before she could ask the husband, the husband actually answered the question. He said, you know that this sickness that she's got became her biggest strength. I said, but how, what do you mean by that? She said, each and every single house in this neighborhood is raided daily by the police to see if there's people that's got any kind of a, just a feeling for being a Christian. But they've stopped raided this house because of her sickness. They don't even go into the house. And that gives her the opportunity to translate English material into Russian for people to read and to inspire them. And that became her strength. And that sounds so crazy. I mean, isn't it interesting that God would use the thing that looks like it's going to destroy your life to actually make your life mean something? Because this gave her life meaning. It actually made her realize what God wanted her to do. That's the type of, and that's the type of strength that Paul is telling us about. The whole message of Jesus and of God to Paul and Paul to us, I believe, is this. The measure in which God's power will be displayed through my life is directly proportional to the measure in which I'm willing to identify and admit my weakness. If you come to God and you say, you know what, Lord, I've got anger issues. He will actually show himself to be strong when you've got reason to be angry. In the meantime, you've got a bunch of other ones, but you don't bring them to God. He's just going to prove him strong in the one that you brought to him, not in the rest. If you're willing to identify and admit to your weaknesses, God will show you his strength. Because you're not in control. He will show you his grace and power. And you will actually have something to brag about then. Rather than yourself. Do you know why Paul didn't give us the detail of the thorn in the flesh? Even the thorn in the flesh, he didn't give us a detail of what it is. Because he didn't want people to think it's all about him. Even when he boasted about his weakness, he didn't go into too much detail. He just said, it's because of my weaknesses that I'm strong. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, in the first chapter already, he wrote this. He said, we do not want you to be uninformed. I do not want you to understand this in the wrong way. Brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia, 
we were under great pressure for beyond our ability to endure so that we despaired of life itself. It was so bad that they even got to the point of despair. You know what? My life's over. It's finished. That's how bad it went. This guy had no pride in him because he didn't, he didn't mind telling people that this is my weakness. I thought, no, this is it. I'm over. I'm dead. There's no hope. There's no hope left. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. And then he says why all this happened. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. For us to experience God's divine power in our lives, we need to admit to our weaknesses. Divine resilience can only be acquired if you are willing to identify and admit to your weaknesses. And you know where the biggest problem is? It's not necessarily admitting it to someone, but it's admitting it to yourself. Because we, we, we are born prideful. We want to do what we want to do. We don't want to admit that we're wrong. We don't want to ask for help. We don't want to tell people, I'm actually a dishonest person. I'm actually a liar. I actually manipulate to get what I want. I actually feel very insecure. We don't like doing that. But in that, there's a miracle. I'm not saying go out and give people all the detail. That's not what Paul did. He actually didn't boast about what was wrong with him. He boasted on how God used the thing that was wrong with him. There's a big difference. Some people like to tell you about all the weaknesses just because they get attention. That's not what Paul did. He said, this is my weakness and this is how God used it. The focus being on God, not on me. Let's all close our eyes. I want to tell you, I want you to, while your eyes are closed, just think in your head of this picture. And create your own, your own pictures. And maybe I'm not going to use the examples that, of your weaknesses, but just put your weakness then in there. You're standing in front of a big wall. This wall is too big to climb over or to go around. And you actually build it yourself to protect yourself. There's a, there's a tap in the wall with a hose on it. And you're standing there with a coffee mug in your hand. The coffee mug resembles your weakness. Your weakness. You feel depressed. You are negative. You seem to be in control, but you're actually very insecure. This is your coffee mug. And the tap in the wall with the host pipe on it, that's God. And He wants to provide for you. He actually wants to fill up your cup with living water, with power. And you open the tap and you you bring the hose pipe under the mug and it slowly fills the mug up. You almost thought that it's not going to make it, but it filled the cup up to the brim and then the water dried up. You felt very inspired and you left just to come again after a while. And this time you bring a bucket, a bit bigger. You realize that you are dishonest. You realize that you struggle to get along with people. You have anger issues. You, you open the tap, you put the hose pipe in the bucket, and it, you see the water coming out, and it's filling up the bucket, and you hope, and you hope for it to fill up the bucket to the brim, and it does. It goes way up to the brim, and then the water just stopped. And you feel so thankful in your heart, And you go away inspired for the next season of your life. 
just to return later with a big thousand liter Jojo tank on a trailer. You lost your job and you know why. You lied. You, you told yourself you're not going to forgive. You're never going to forgive. You feel so powerless. You grab the hose pipe and you just threw it into the tank. And you thought, this is never going to make it. And it took a while, but the water started filling your tank. And it actually went up to the brim again before the water died. And you got curious. Where does this water come from? And why is it always just enough? You walked away inspired just to come back with a tanker. You got a truck with a tank on it, with a trailer with another tank on it. And you backed it up all the way to the wall with the hoses. You've been diagnosed with a terminal sickness. You lost a loved one. Your child died. Your marriage is gone. You've lost everything that you hold dear to your life. You actually have a physical impairment that you have to live with the rest of your life. It's a weakness. That's going to hinder you a lot. You take the hose pipe. You put it in the tanker. And you wait. The water runs in. And it doesn't stop. And it filled up the first tank. You threw it in the second one. And it filled up the second tank. And you felt yourself being released. And you experienced the power and grace of God in that moment. But you were so so wondering where's this water coming from that you needed to find out but there's no way over this wall or to walk around it the wall that you built there was only one way and that was to break it down so you broke down the wall and you followed the pipeline behind the wall and when you looked up you saw a sea with kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of water your eyes couldn't even find the end of the water The sea of God's power and grace ready to overcome each and every single weakness that you might have. He can even overcome the world's weaknesses with that sea. Doesn't matter what kind of container you bring. He will give you grace and power. But you need to bring your weakness. You need to make it known. You need to identify it. And you need to trust God. So I want to challenge you this morning. Identify your weakness. Let God show you. Ask Him to show you. And He will. And let Him give you power and grace to overcome it. Amen. Our weaknesses are usually best seen when we experience trials and tribulations. That's when they come out. That's usually when we'll find them. And for me to be more aware of them than my strength is going to help me to get through it. And this morning when we, when we look at this communion table, We actually need to thank Jesus for taking our weaknesses so that we can be strong. Because that's what he did. I'm too weak to be good enough for God. But Jesus said, I am good enough for my Father. Maybe it's time for you to lay down the things that you think you deserve so that God can show you what you really do deserve. His power and His grace. He wants to enable you to get through anything. And if it overwhelms you, he's got a plan with it. And he can make it work out brilliant. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you for this word this morning. Thank you that you inspire. Thank you that you make us strong even though we are weak. Lord, help us not to rely on our own strength, on our own impressive CV. Help us not to throw our impressive CV out to all the people around us, but rather to boast like Paul about our weakness and how God uses it. So that we can also proclaim the good news, just like John and Peter. Thank you, Lord, that you never leave us. Thank you, Lord, that you love us too much to leave us the way we are. We love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen.